In this video, I cover an extreme version of altruism called eusociality, and then move on to talking about situations in which you see individuals that you would suspect would be very cooperative, but how there can be conflict in those situations. And then we end with kind of the reverse of that, situations where individuals show altruistic behaviors with a lack of kin selection being involved, in which uh, individuals are not related but are still providing altruistic behaviors. Eusociality is basically just an extreme version of altruism, and it requires several uh, preconditions. The first is there has to be overlap of generations. There has to be cooperative brood care helping, as we've talked about in the past. And this really is no different from the other examples of altruism that we've talked about previously, in which individuals were helpers, uh, helping uh, close relatives raise their brothers and sisters. What makes you sociality different is some of the individuals in the population are specialized sterile casts, individuals that are non-reproductive for their entire life and they're just completely incapable of reproduction. And we generally refer to these as workers or soldiers, depending on their task associated with the colony of, of eusocial organisms. And again, what makes this eusocial is these workers or soldiers never breed. They have no ability for having direct fitness. Eusociality is fairly common in insects. It can be seen in many cases in hymenoptera, ants, bees, and wasps. It can also be seen in termites, isopods, but it's also seen in other arthropods like some crustaceans like these uh, shrimp that are shown here, and it's even found in one group of vertebrates, the mole rats. Now I'd like to focus on why eusociality might be more common in the hymenoptera. One of the things that hymenoptera have that may predispose them to eusociality is their genetic system. They have what's called haplodiploidy. We'll go over that in a minute. There are some other things that may also be linked to why eusociality is so common in these because many of them uh, produce these very complicated uh, nests that may require a large degree of cooperation. So, eusociality really common in uh, the hymenoptera, ants, bees, and wasps. And as I mentioned, they have this haplodiploidy genetic system, which may predispose them to eusociality because it alters the degrees of relatedness between individuals involved in the, in the colony, or at least some of the individuals. W.D. Hamilton was the first to link this genetic system to the potential reason why eusociality is so common in the hymenoptera, so let's explain haplodiploidy. Males develop from unfertilized eggs. So the males have half the DNA as the females do. And they each male then produces sperm simply through mitosis, not meiosis. So the result of this is they're passing on to their offspring all of their DNA, but it's just half of the DNA compared to the females. And all of the sperm have the identical DNA. Females, on the other hand, just develop from fertilized eggs and they're diploid-like regular. Here's a graphic that just kind of summarizes the reproduction uh, differences between males and females and their, diplo their ploidy level. So the mothers, the queens, in example like we'll talk about honeybees, the queens are diploid. So they pass half of their DNA to their daughters and half of their DNA every time they reproduce and, and produce a male, which we'll see are called drones. Dads, on the other hand, never produce sons. Sons are simply produced by unfertilized haploid eggs. If sperm is ever used to fertilize an egg, it develops into a worker honeybee or a worker, individual, whatever species we're talking about in Hymenoptera. Or it could uh, also produce a future reproductive queen. So now let's make a simplifying assumption. Let's say that the queen mates one time. So all of the sperm that she uses to produce daughters have sperm from that single male, and all of those paternal genes are going to be the same. So just from the paternal contribution in these daughters, they're guaranteed sisters are going to be related to each other by 
just from the paternal aspect of their genes. But because females are diploid, they get the other 50% of their genes from mom, and these eggs are produced in the normal way through meiosis, and so they have a 50% chance of sharing any single allele at any single gene. And that's because during meiosis, it not only cuts the DNA in half from diploid to haploid, but because of independent assortment and crossing over, it randomizes the combinations of alleles at different loci. And so they have a 50% chance of sharing any single allele at any single gene. So this means that sisters are related to each other by 25% from their mom. They get 50% of mom's genes, and they have a 50% chance of sharing any single one of those genes. So that reduces it to 25% relatedness just through mom. But you add this up together and you see that the total relatedness of the sisters to each other is 75%. 50% paternal, 25% maternal. Well, the queens who are actually doing the reproduction, they're actually laying the eggs that are producing their, their daughters and these sisters uh, to each other. These queens are only related to their offspring by the typical 50%. They're passing on 50% of their DNA in each egg that they produce. So this leads to the bizarre consequence that sisters are more closely related to each other than they would be to their own offspring. So yes, they can't reproduce. They can't pass on their DNA. But they have a great opportunity now to gain through the indirect route of fitness. Because remember, that is when you help a close relative increase their reproductive success. So if they can help mom reproduce lots and lots of sisters, they're getting 75% of their DNA passed on with each sister that's produced. And here's a graphic that may help you understand how the 75% comes about. Let's say we're talking about a simple case where we just have two chromosomes, uh, A and B, uh, one of which is uh, just this normal shape, the other one has this little hook to it, um, and that a, a queen has is diploid so she's got two copies of each of these well through the general process of crossing over an independent assortment it's really just showing independent assortment here you're going to get all possible combinations of the blue and the red here in the eggs that she produces so we have both blue both red one of the blue and one of the red of each type is also being formed so that's what the females can do but, but if we look at the male, the male always produces sperm that has the exact same genetics, the same A and B chromosomes with the exact same genes. So if you look on the right side of each of these fertilized eggs that's going to produce daughters and sisters relative to each other, the right side always has the same DNA contribution from the male. Now, they're going to vary depending on the female contribution depending on which of these eggs was used but they're guaranteed to be related to each other by 50 percent just from the male alone and here's a way that we can look at each of those eggs that was produced and look at the fraction if we just pick one of these at random and set it over here and calculate the average relatedness between individuals of each of those four eggs again the right side's the same always 50 percent this individual compared to this individual they share this blue plain one with the female so the average relatedness here between these two is 75 percent this one's related 75 percent to this one through this red hooked one this individual actually tends to be exactly a clone of this individual they're 100 percent related sometimes potentially they don't share any of the same maternal genes that's one potential but again they still have at least dad's genes by 50 percent so if you add these four together, 75, 75, 150, the average of those is 75%. So you may start seeing the potential now because of this relatedness, these, this increased relatedness between sisters, it helps to establish a indirect route of fitness. This explains why workers work hard to help mom produce more sisters, specifically reproductive sisters. So mom is going to be producing future queens. And she's also going to be producing additional workers, but that's just a means to an end. 
the reproductive potential of those workers and the queen and the colony as a whole is how successful they are at producing queens in large part, future queens. This system also explains why only females serve as workers. They're the only ones that have this extra genetic potential by serving as a worker. Males are only related to their sisters by 50%, the normal 50%. And it turns out that the workers really want to produce reproductive sisters. They don't get very much out of producing reproductive males. So the fewer brothers they help to produce, it's actually better for them because they're only related to their brothers by 25%. And that's because the males are haploid. Now, your, your brain may be kind of exploding right now trying to keep all these numbers set, so I'm trying to show you graphics that will help you see the logic of this. And here's one I put together to kind of explain why, on average, the sisters are related to their brothers by 25%. But at the same time, the brothers are related to their sisters by 50%. So, let's say we've got this queen. And this drone, that's what the reproductive males are called. Again, all he can do is produce that. That's not even related at all between brother and sister. Remember, brothers don't get any sperm. They're haploid. They don't have a father. So the only potential genes and chromosomes that can be shared between a sister and a brother come from mom. And so it turns out in this case that this one is different between the sister and brother but this one is the one that's shared. So in this case, we have, from the female's perspective, one of the four chromosomes is shared with the brother. That's 25%. Well, that same chromosome that is shared between brother and sister represents 50% of the brother's DNA because he only has half of the amount of DNA. So that's why we can have 50% relatedness of brothers to sisters in the same individuals it's, can, it would be 25% between the sister and the brother. So haplodiploidy may predispose certain hymenoptera to have eusociality, but it's not a complete answer. And, and it also is not linked to perfect kind of cooperation between individuals of the hive. We still see conflict in hives, and that's oftentimes associated with sex ratio stresses. Remember, the workers are related to their future, the future queens, their sisters, by 75%. So that's really where they're getting the most bang for the buck. That's what they want to raise. But the queens are equally related to their sons and the daughters. Remember, they're passing on 50% of their genes in each one. So they want an equal representation of males and females produced, but the workers want by far more queens produced. Additionally, I made a simplifying assumption to make the strongest case for a high degree of relatedness between the sisters, and that was that the queen mated one time. It turns out in some species, the queens actually mate multiple times. In one study of honeybees, she actually mated uh, about 17 times, and that reduces the average sister relatedness to only about 33%. Additionally, in some species of Hymenoptera, there are multiple queens that found nests, and so some of the sisters are not related at all. They don't share the same mother. So in these haplodiploid species, these things can reduce that over-relatedness between sisters that I was talking about. So it may be part of the answer, but it may not be the entire answer of what's going on. And lastly, not all eusocial species are haplodiploid. The naked mole rats that we talked about earlier, and I'm going to go into an example uh, later, they're not haplodiploid, but they are eusocial. Additionally, not all haplodiploid species are eusocial. There are some hymenoptera that live solitary lives and are not eusocial. So just because you're haplodiploid does not mean you're going to be eusocial. Let me tell you a little bit more about naked mole rats. They live in these uh, eusocial groups with a queen and two to three reproductive males or kings uh, and several workers. Now they live in dry soils of Africa and they uh, spend almost their entire life underground. Most individuals do, but they dig these burrows looking for tubers that are widely scattered in this environment. But it takes a long time to dig these tunnels, and finding food that's widely scattered is difficult. And so they all have to cooperate to dig these tunnels to find food so that they can all survive. But you may be wondering, remember I talked about earlier in the semester, individuals do things for their, their own selfish fitness interests. They don't do things for the good of the group. And especially if the queen is the only female reproducing and only certain males are reproducing, 
why are these workers participating in this? Well, one, if they went off to live on their own, they wouldn't be able to find food and survive. So by helping the group, they are also helping themselves just survive. But it turns out these groups are widely scattered and separated from each other without a lot of gene flow. And so they tend to be highly inbred. And so in one study, the average individuals related to each other by 81%. So that's even greater than haplodiploidy average relatedness under the strictest assumptions. So in situations like this, it doesn't really matter who mates. If you're all fairly closely related, if you have, if you reproduce, you're passing on your genes, or if you help other individuals reproduce that are almost clones of you, you are also passing on your genes. So I've been kind of focusing on altruistic acts that lead to cooperation between individuals living in groups. Sometimes individuals living in groups that you might expect to show a high degree of cooperation, that they still show conflict. So, for example, in mammals, nursing mothers have conflict with their own offspring. So a mom with a large litter may want to spread out her milk equally among all offspring that are likely to survive. That may maximize her direct reproductive success. But each individual offspring wants to get the lion's share of that milk because the fatter they get, the more healthy they are, the faster they grow, it increases their likelihood of survival, maybe at a cost of their brothers and sisters. But if some of those aren't going to survive anyway, they, they're looking out for number one. They're behaving in a selfish manner. So they want to have more of the milk, more of their share, but mom may want to evenly spread that out. So that's one potential conflict, even between offspring and parents. And eventually, the mom has to wean the young from the milk. From the young's perspective, the longer they can get that easy access to resources, it might be better off for them. But from a mom's perspective, the sooner she's able to cut them off with them still having a reasonable chance of reproduction, uh, the better probably for her future reproductive success. She's not just interested in what that individual group of offspring can do to survive. She's trying to maximize lifetime reproductive success. And so that usually involves a trade-off between what she can do now and what she can do in the future. But again, from the individual that's just trying to get as much milk as he or she can, that may be in their own best interest. And so that can also lead to conflict. And so oftentimes at weaning, you see a lot of crying and, and uh, angst between uh, parents and their offspring. So the mothers can be aggressive or dismissive and the offspring respond by kicking and screaming and maybe even attacking the female. Let's go back to the idea of what was going on with the white-fronted bee eaters. Remember, one of the things I said that they do sometimes is they will attempt to nest. Young birds will attempt to nest. And if that nest fails, they go back and help their family. Well, it turns out the fathers of some white-fronted bee eaters will harass their sons, particularly their younger sons, to actually cause their nest to fail. They're doing this because that increases the chance that their sons will then become the helpers at their nest and help them raise their other brothers and sisters. Now, the risk of being recruited by your father in this way depends on your relatedness. If it's your dad doing it, you're definitely more likely to do it. Dad is less likely to do that to his grandsons. And if you watch these interactions, the sons don't really try to combat this too much. They don't resist that much. And dad can be very persistent if he is going to need that help. There are a couple of reasons for this. If you think about the relatedness between the sons and their own offspring and to their brothers and sisters, it's the same. So sons and dad's relationship to their own offspring is 50%. And that's the same as the son's relationship to its full siblings. But if you think about it from the dad's point of view, if he just let his son reproduce, he's only getting 25% of that because that's the production of his grandchildren. There's one additional point here too. They usually pick on the youngest sons simply because the youngest sons are most likely not to be successful. They don't really have a good background of experience of being parents and so their reproductive potential is going to be low anyway and that's why they're less resistant to uh, dad's recruitment attempts because at least they're going to be raising their siblings and they're going to be gaining experience so that when they actually do reproduce, they're more likely to be effective. 
And that's why the youngest sons tend to be targeted more than older sons, older, more experienced sons. Here's another area of potential conflict between individuals that you think would be more cooperative. Siblings sometimes kill each other. And in many bird species in which this occurs, the parents are pretty much just passive observers, letting, letting them duke it out. So why is this? How could this be adaptive? This seems like it would not be adaptive from the sibling's point of view or the parents. Because both of these are related to the victims, whoever is killed in these interactions, by 50%. Well, there are two situations in which this could be adapted and natural selection could lead to this type of behavior being an adaptation. The first is if you're in an environment that is unpredictable, you lay eggs assuming the best, that food is going to be plentiful and that all will survive. If, however, when they hatch, there's not really enough food to go around, you have to have some simple way of reducing the brood, and this is what we call brood reduction, reducing the brood via siblicide. And one of the things that these birds do that practice this, oftentimes they hatch their young in an asynchronous manner so that the youngest to hatch, the ones that hatch last, if there's not enough food available, it makes it easier for their big brothers and sisters to kill them off without too much battle where they all could get hurt. So that's one situation in which siblicide, if there's just really not enough food to go around, somebody's got to get killed off. And so by ha having them hatch asynchronously, it makes this an easier process to occur if it, if it happens to happen. However, if it happens to be a good year, maybe there's enough food to go around, you won't see siblicide in those years. So that's one situation in which siblicide might be adapted. Here's another. In some species that tend to have low hatchability rates, meaning that oftentimes if you lay a clutch of five, only four hatch. Well, if you can take care of four, or you can take care of five, let's say, lay six. Because if one of them doesn't hatch, you've still got the maximum number that you can raise successfully. Well, what happens if occasionally you do lay the six, counting on one of them not to work, but they all hatch. Oops, now see we're in a situation where we've got too many young for the available food supply. And so we again, we have to have a mechanism for brood reduction to get us back to an optimal clutch size that matches the resource levels in the environment. And again, these are the species that tend to have asynchronous hatching so that that youngest individual, if it does hatch, if, it, if all of them hatch, it's easier to have that individual killed through siblicide. So I've been focusing on kin selection being driven by the degree of relatedness between individuals, between the, the altruist and the individual that they're helping. And that's what really drives those types of altruistic behaviors, that relatedness really is key in many cases. Is there certain circumstances in which altruistic behavior can be seen between unrelated individuals? Under certain circumstances, this can occur, and it's called reciprocal altruism. But there are restricted situations, again, in which this would occur. And one of those uh, requirements is that the cost of the altruistic act is relatively low. So we're not talking about giving up a full reproductive season or sacrificing your life to uh, save another individual. Because whatever this altruistic act is, it is reciprocated. That's why it's called reciprocal altruism individuals that are receiving the altruistic act, the benefits of an altruistic act, individuals that receive the benefits of an altruistic act at one time have to repay that altruistic act in kind in the future, or there has to be some type of punishment to them so that they don't get that same kind of benefit in the future. So when are we most likely to see a situation like this? Well, individuals have to live in stable groups, there has to be potential for reciprocity, so there has to be many opportunities for the altruistic act to occur in lifetime. Individuals have to remember the altruistic act and who gave them an altruistic act or who owes them an altruistic act. And repayment has to be common enough or there has to be some type of reinforcement so that individuals do repay, so that there is some degree of punishment for those that don't play right. And that last point is key because what prevents cheaters from taking advantage 
of altruists in this situation. If some individuals are constantly giving the, these altruistic benefits but never getting a return, they're just suckers. They're getting suckered into this. And this leads to a situation which has called, been called the prisoner's dilemma in game theory. I'm going to talk about two different things here. I'm going to talk about prisoner's dilemma and tit for tat. Students oftentimes get these confused. Prisoner's dilemma is the reason why reciprocity might be difficult to evolve. So just think about that right now. We'll talk about a potential solution to that soon, and that's called tit for tat. But the problem with reciprocity is defined by the prisoner's dilemma. So let's say that we have two individuals. These individuals come together and they have the potential to cooperate and they get certain degree of reward. If, however, the payoff to player A when they cooperate, but player B defects, then player A is getting the sucker's payoff. They're getting taken advantage of. Well, what's the other side of this coin? Well, in that situation, if player B is the one that cooperated, but player A defects and takes advantage of them, this is just described as the temptation to defect. So you get a big benefit here. And it may be a bigger benefit than the reward for mutual cooperation. And what we're going to see is this leads to a system of distrust where nobody wants to cooperate. And so there tends to be mutual defections and punishments associated with that. So they may have been able to, if they would have just worked together, get some gain. But because of this, they can't trust each other. And so they suffer. So putting some numbers to this and putting it into the original kind of idea of the prisoner's dilemma, it's called a prisoner's dilemma because let's say that the police pick up two suspects from, say, a robbery. When they take them into interrogation rooms, they don't take them in the same room, right? So they're going to interrogate them in separate rooms with different sets of cops doing the interview or the uh, interrogation, and they're telling each of them, hey, if you squeal on your partner and give us enough evidence, we'll give you a deal and maybe you won't go to jail. You'll just get probation. If they do this, then, then this defector here is not going to get any jail time. Okay, but again, the other side of that coin here is if player A cooperates with player B and doesn't defect, but player B defects and squeals on them, player A is going to go to prison maybe for 10 years. And, and this asymmetry and potential jail time leads this to be a big temptation, this big temptation to defect for player A. And the reason they don't interrogate them together is if they both looked at each other and said, look, these cops don't have anything on us. If we just keep our mouth shut, you know, we may get a little bit of jail time, but just be quiet. You know, it'll, it'll, it, it'll be minimal. If, however, maybe they both squeal at the same time, the cops go, you know what, let's just send them both to jail. We got enough evidence on both of them, send them to five years. So. This is the potential benefit if they would cooperate. Here's the temptation that what leads to the temptation to squeal on each other. And here's the mutual penalty for them both defecting. So you can think about the prisoner's dilemma being associated with uh, penalties associated with prison time. And that's how it was originally discussed. Or you can think about it like finding food. And if they would just cooperate together and find food, you'd get a big number here. Um, but if they're just scrambling by themselves, they're not going to get very much. Um, and if one finds food but doesn't tell the other, boy, it's going to get a, a lot of, of food and the other individual is going to get uh, the sucker's payoff. So you can think about it in multiple ways. But this temptation not to cooperate is what leads to the problems. So reciprocity, the evolution of it has some issues. So when can it evolve? Well, reciprocity can evolve when the recipients of cooperative behavior is likely to meet up with the cooperative individual in the future and that cooperative individual says, hey, I did that favor for you, I need a favor now. This sets up a, a condition that can enforce reciprocity and make it work, which is called tit for tat. So tit for tat is a way that you might be able to counter the prisoner's dilemma. So this is how tit for tat works. If an individual cooperates on their first encounter with another individual and serves as the altruist, then they meet in the future. Individuals do whatever was done to them in the previous interaction. That's what it means, tit for tat. Such that it's both a retaliatory and a forgiving situation. So let me give you an example to, to maybe drive home how tit for tat works. You got some roommates and you come home one day and one of your roommates says, hey, I want to go out tonight, but I'm kind of short on cash. I don't get paid till next week. Can you spot me 20 bucks? 
All right. Do, are there requirements met here? Is it a st stable social situation? Yeah. I mean, assuming you see your roommate on a regular basis, you know where they sleep. You know where you're going to find them. You know who they are. You have the ability to keep track of, yeah, I gave you 20 bucks, right? So everything's good so far. Now, this individual in the future can do one of two things. Next week when they get paid, you confront them and say, hey, remember that 20 bucks that I lent you? I need it back. And they go, oh, uh, sorry, I, I, gotta, I gotta run, I'm late for work, uh, we'll talk about it later. They take off and they keep dodging you on it in the future. So in that situation, if that was what they did, what your move is the next time they come to you for another loan is you say, no, no way, you stiffed me. So I'm not going to cooperate with you in the future. But here's where the forgiving part comes in. Let's say that that individual, your roommate, comes back to you and says, yeah, sorry, I was being a real jerk. You know, I feel bad about it. Here's the 20 bucks. All right, cool. No problem. You've reset the table. So that if then they come to you in the future, you're more likely to give them the 20 bucks if it reestablishes this trust uh, that they will repay. So it's retaliatory potentially for one step if they don't pay you back the benefit that you gave them. But it's forgiving as soon as they do return the favor. So here's a classic example of reciprocal altruism in nature. So vampire bats can live in these colonies and they fly out at night looking for mammals to feed on to get a blood meal. Now when you return to the colony, some individuals found a big cow or a dog and they uh, fed on them and so they're just full of blood. Other individuals in the colony that might be your roostmate because they tend to stay in the same areas in the, in the cave. Uh, this is important because now they all know who each other are. It's a stable social relationship. You know, Jim comes back and looks over at Bob, and Bob didn't have a good night. And so Bob goes, hey, I see you got a pretty full belly there. Um, why don't you regurgitate some of that blood from me? Because I'm, I'm really hurting here. Because if you look down here on this chart, just a few days without feeding, it's going to increase your potential for starvation. So there's a curve associated with your weight, associated with your previous feeding success, and the farther you are out from being fed successfully, you're going to be losing weight. So the D and the C here are associated with a donor and the cost to the donor and a recipient of regurgitated blood and the benefit to that recipient. So this is Bob and this is, I don't know, what did I say, Jim? Uh, but, but if Jim came back really fat and happy, got lots of blood, it says, sure, I'll regurgitate some blood for you. It's going to lose weight, right? It's actually going to push itself closer to death to starvation just a little bit. But that cost is relatively minor. But look at the benefit to Bob over here. Man, this is great. He was, he was just, just hours from death, maybe not even going to make it overnight or over the day uh, until the next night. The benefit that this individual has to put them much farther away from starvation is huge. Relative low cost, high potential benefit. The next night, maybe they go out and the tables are turned. Bob may be the one that found a blood meal. Jim didn't. So as long as then Jim goes, oh man, I'm really hurting, but I see you got a, a good blood meal. And remember last, yesterday, I was the one that gave you some blood, so return the favor. This stable situation makes it where they're, in the long run, going to both be benefiting from reciprocal altruism. So that's how it can exist between unrelated individuals. Yes, in some cases, it's associated with mothers and their offspring or close relatives regurgitating blood. And in those circumstances, kin selection can be what's going on or just simple parental care if it's mother to offspring. But when it's associated with unrelated individuals, that's when it becomes an example of reciprocal altruism. So this is what I was talking about in the case of unrelated individuals. This reciprocity in the long run helps both the uh, individuals that at one time are going to serve as donors and the other time is going to serve as a recipient. And here's a colony of these vampire bats in the genus Desmodus, and they tend to have these stable relationships. So these individuals tend to always be resting in the colony in the same position, and so they have a relationship. These individuals are more likely to have a relationship, and they're more likely to, to share in this reciprocal altruistic system. 
The next video is going to cover life history evolution, and this is uh, different strategies that different organisms use uh, throughout their life for partitioning energy for growth, development, uh, maturation, reproduction, and survival.